This is the agenda. I know you guys can read it, so I won't read it to you. We're going to do an overview uh, of where we're at now and where we've been in the last year or two years. Um, then we're going to go into uh, what, what I think are some of the forces that are driving uh, what we're going to see in the market in Ontario um, uh, next year. I am going to be talking more about the GTA, um, but I will sometimes reference Ontario numbers. Um, I'll talk about which areas uh, might be of interest anywhere in the world, actually. Um, I think we stick to North America for that part. Um, uh, whether pre-construction condos should be a part of an investment strategy or not. <coughs> um, uh, if the investing in the U.S. is still a good idea or not. Uh, people have been talking about it for 10, 12, 15 years. Some people doing it and some people just talking about it. So I'll let you know what I think. Um, if anybody's into Airbnb, I will talk to you a little bit about some automation tools. Just one or two slides. You guys can take a picture of them if you'd like. Um, quick little plug for energy saving plugs. See what I did there? Okay, anyway, nobody laughed. That's great. Um, and how, how you can make some money. Um, if you are finding properties like my clients that I was just mentioning that under, are under market value, how you can relatively quickly turn things around or if you're going to have a longer term uh, strategy. Just about to get started, but you still have the opportunity to introduce yourselves if you'd like. Oh, my actual Yes. Hi. New to investments. Okay. And do you have any pitch, service, or product that you want to talk about for 10 seconds? You don't have to. So invest in uh, duplex. So you're interested in investing in duplex? Yeah. Okay. Outside. By yourself or with a partner? Uh, yes. Sir. Okay. Good. Anybody has a duplex outside of Toronto? I just saw a great one in Port Hope. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Chitra. Okay. Just joined. Welcome. Who dragged who? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So this is the overview of what we're going to be doing for about an hour and a half. Um, so I'm going to get into, uh, uh, you, you can skim through these quickly. I have a slide for each one. Anybody who feels like this might be a little too small, you're welcome to get slowly closer. There's still some empty spots at the front. Everybody's eyesight's a little different. Um, but I'll get into them in individual slides, so you'll probably be able to read a little better. <coughs> still no question? Nobody wants to give me a break from coughing? No? Okay. Ah, no. But that's a great question. I think you should have a chocolate. Thank you. Um, <coughs> it's just the first one or two. You have to get them out of the, out of the, yeah, exactly. Um, so who's heard of, uh, there's just a little bit of money out there in Ontario that might be switching hands over the next few decades. Nobody? Nobody's heard about this? Um, there've been a few articles about this in the last couple of years. Um, what I think is, is quite interesting is that, um, uh, between 2018 and 2038, <laughs> we're looking at about a trillion dollars switching hands. Um, now, that number could go up or down depending on what actually happens in the real estate market and general investment markets, um, but it's still a pretty big number and it's over a relatively short period of time, uh, 20 years. Hey guys, go ahead. Um, so one thing that, that's, uh, that, that remains to be seen is how much of this money will end up into millennial, the millennial generation. Um, I suspect that it, not, not all of it, but a good part of it will end up uh, in millennials' hands in the next 20 years. The, the, case, uh, the, the proof is just what I've been observing for the last five to 10 years, um, where younger people, first-time buyers, having a hard time getting into the market, and mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, uh, very, very, very sweet older friend um, are helping them get in. And so I think that's just going to increase more and more. I'm just going to keep going if nobody raises their hand. Good so far? Okay. Um, so retirees are staying in their homes longer. So about 10 years ago, there was a big thing about downsizing. People were talking about, oh, yeah, you know, all these people, uh, uh, 55, 60, 65, uh, 70 plus in these big homes, they're all going to sell them and there's going to be lots and lots of supply. Um, well, some of that happened, uh, but not a ton. And in fact, I've actually had a contractor here uh, about a year ago who specializes in, um, uh, in assisting retirees to mod uh, modify their homes so that they can stay in them for another 10, 15, 20 years past when they might otherwise be able to. So um, uh, making it so that there's more ground floor space, so that there's less of a need to go to the basement to access laundry facilities, so that the second floor is really reserved for guests or storage, uh, things like that. Sound familiar? Okay. Um, <coughs> so the point of this slide is... Father, like it's being ADA compliant. Yeah, that too. It's a barrier for accessibility. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you put in an elevator or you put it in an assistant device near it, then you get up and down the stairs. Or yeah. Even to get in from the street. 
I, I agree, yeah. So ramps or, or circular... Uh, so that's 40? Uh, Fodi's the gentleman I was referring to. So the point of this slide is to just say that as much as it was a, a very hyped uh, movement in the last 10 years that, oh, retirees are going to be selling all their houses, there's going to be a ton of uh, uh, availability, that's really not happened as much as it thought we thought it would, it would be happening. <coughs> what are the reasons? Sorry? Why? What's the reason? And people want to stay in their house. Yeah, I mean, people in general, uh, if they're in a home that they've lived in for, for a few decades, are generally con uh, content. What typically I see happening is it takes a few, a few people in a neighborhood to, to have the courage to say, you know what, I'm selling and I'm moving into a condo or I'm, not, or I'm moving down south or I'm going somewhere warmer. Um, because really, when you have, if you live in a community, you've been there for several decades, many people forge strong ties in the community. And so to be able to just pull up and say, buy everybody, buy family, buy friends, etc., people are having a harder time doing it than we thought they would. I'm sorry? Right. No, that's still happening. We still have a lot of snowbirds. You also have to understand the market value of homes are, 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 are quite favorable. And even if you sell it, what can you buy in return? So it's a question of affordability. Yeah. Sometimes it's a difficult situation to make a move and to move from one property to another, even if you downsize, it's not always, it's not always to your advantage. Yeah. And I've, and I've had chats with clients who've talked, who've considered selling and they'll have big four or five bedroom homes, you know, three, 4,000 square feet. And, uh, and I'll say, well, why are you holding on to this? You, you're barely using it. It's my pension. Well, there's that, that, and then, but there's also, you'd, you'd be amazed at how often I've heard there's nowhere else that the whole family can get together at the same time. You imagine holding on to a huge home just for that reason, but but it happens. So that's the human element, right? So it's you look at the numbers. It might make a lot of sense to sell, invest some of that, buy something else. And the older you get, the more resistant you are to change. You're speaking from experience, Cam. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I noticed some people they are comparing the cost of the uh, living in apartments versus a house, and they find out some sort of the not good deal to go into apartment and pay almost similar maintenance costs. So like a, con a condo? Yes, as the house on, and on top of that, the staying in the house essentially has bigger momentum in uh, price increase and a source for the funding. I would, I would have a slight disagreement with you depending on the location of the house versus the condo <clears throat> and the values. So over a million dollar, freehold, so non-condo house in Toronto, I would argue that a condo unit under a million dollars will has been and will continue to appreciate on a percentage basis faster than the freehold home. Um, and I, I've usually I'll spend an hour having this conversation that I'm about to give you guys in 67 seconds. So keep that in mind. Huge pros and cons um, in both houses, and I'm going to call them what they are, freehold. So freehold means not condo and condo apartments. Um, the way that I sometimes will explain maintenance fees is if you live in a freehold property, you theoretically, if you're very good with your numbers, and I've known a few accountants or really financially savvy people who will literally put aside every month money for the future roof replacement, the future window replacement, furnace, AC, repainting every 10 years, flooring every 15 or 20, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the way that I look at condos and I explain sometimes to clients is it's a forced savings plan. So the largest components, usually when you own a condo apartment um, that you're going to have to face paying, uh, that, you, that are going to have to be replaced are usually the responsibility of the condo corporation. So they're taking your forced savings and replacing the windows and the roof and the building envelope and things like that, underground parking, etc. cetera. Um, so that's dollars wise. And the other one is you're right. Sometimes if you say, look, I, I just bought a house that's brand new or somebody just did a big renovation, I shouldn't have to do much for 15 or 20 years. Furnace is new, AC, roof, windows, etc. There's still a convenience factor, right? So, I mean, and depending on, on the demographic that you're in, how much you travel, how safe you feel in certain areas, a lot of my clients will say, look, I like the fact that I can literally just close the door, walk away for three months. I come back. I know it's going to be the way I left it, maybe a little dusty, but that's it. Whereas a freehold property, uh, neighbor, can you check in every now and then? Are my pipes going to freeze in the winter? Ba 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 ba. Yes? No, no problem. Thanks for the question. Do you want a chocolate? All right. Milk chocolate for you. That was a good question. Okay.
recently heard about a new startup which is helping these um, old retirees get old their like all the stuff that they have. Yes. So they buy their stuff and then they help them move. Relocate. That's interesting. I actually know a few um, professional organizers who help people at that stage in their lives. I didn't know that there was a startup doing that. Fantastic. I'd love to talk with them. They probably know when people are going to be selling their homes. <laughs> Connect me with them. Um, uh, so, so one quick yeah. question. You, you talked about this before, and I know this isn't the, the time for discussion, but you talk about reverse mortgaging. Mm -hmm. Is that another reason? Is that something that you'll talk about tonight? No, it's not something that I will, but I'm happy to mention it. Has anybody heard of reverse mortgages? Um, so I, I recently had a client, 70 years old. She was. She called me and said, you need to sell my condo. I said, I'm surprised. Why? Young in St. Clair, great location. I sold it to her just five years ago. And she said, well, I have a line of credit. I can't remember, $250,000, $300,000 on it. And line of credit, I have to I, I have to pay every month. I have to service it. Um, between that, maintenance fees, property taxes, and just living, I'm, and she's retired. So, so all she's doing is pulling for the line of credit. And she says, in three to six months, there's no more money. Like, it's all gone. And she said, I have to sell it. And I looked at it with her and asked her to get some numbers from in, her investment advisor. She thought she was going to sell the condo, invest a lot of the proceeds, the equity, and then live off of the investment income. Well, the numbers showed, depending on how much... Uh, her rent would be where she would move into that she was going to run out of money in 10 to 15 years. Like literally just run out. So kind of you have to pray, I don't live more than 10 or 15 years because otherwise I have big problems or I'm, I'm putting a lot of, of pressure on family members to put me up in their home. Um, so what we ended up doing, <laughs> I proposed to her to look into reverse mortgages. A lot of people who know about reverse mortgages from years ago have a negative connotation because usually older people who get them, and there's this idea that, oh, maybe they're getting into a, making a financial decision that they don't understand. So what a reverse mortgage is, is that it's, it's based on statistical information. So depending on how old you are and literally how long you're expected to live, a bank, all, all, I, as far as I know, all the big banks do this, but there are lenders that specialize in this type of mortgage. They will lend you, I think it's 50, 55% of your property's value maximum as a lump mortgage. You pay no monthly pay payments, no interest, no principal repayment. The only time you repay it is when you die or when you sell. So you still have the opportunity to sell and, and, and repay it. The interest rate is a little higher. It's usually in the, right now it'd be around five, four and a half, five, five and a quarter percent. Um, but basically it's going to allow this client of mine to live in her condo um, and probably not have to sell it for at least 20 years. And there are other benefits such as when she does sell, um, she'll probably sell. Right now, we think it's worth. I think it's worth about nine hundred and fifty to a million dollar, nine hundred and fifty thousand to a million dollars. If she were to sell now, she'd get all of the profit tax free. But if she sells in twenty years for two million dollars, she would get all of the gain tax free as well, because it's her principal residence. Whereas if she had sold and lived off of investment income, that income would be taxed. So, it's a pretty complicated situation, but. Reverse mortgages are an interesting, for a very specific situation, including hers. Thanks for mentioning it, Lawrence. Um, reverse mortgages can be interesting, but really for the, the right person, the right situation. Okay. Do you want a chocolate? No. I, I will tell you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you just ruined it for everybody, Lawrence. <laughs> Don't think about your dentist tonight. Um, so, uh, uh, retirees are not selling their homes quite as quickly or downsizing as we thought they would. Ironically, adult children are staying as long as well. So part of the reason very well could be, oh, I can't let my poor 20, 30, 40 year old um, uh, not have somewhere to live. Um, so uh, adult children are staying quite a bit longer. And the number is pretty interesting. Um, based on the last census, which is a couple years old, 35% of Canadians aged between 20 and 34 years old live with their parents, lived with their parents in 2016. It's a pretty big number. And if the numbers continue to climb, which I don't think they will, but if they did continue to climb the way they, they had between, uh, uh, between 2012 and 2016, no, sorry, between 2001 and 2016, um, we could be up to about 43% of uh, 20 to 34 year olds no, living with I'm their parents. Surprised, actually, no? Because the, you have to understand too, <coughs> in this current market, your earning income, I mean, when you consider your, your grandparents or your great grandparents, 
when they bought a property, usually, wasn't it the rule of thumb that usually it's three to four times your income is what you could buy a house? Right. It, it's disproportionate to what people are earning. Today. Absolutely. So I agree. So more kids are staying at home, hopefully with the intent to save up for a mortgage to buy something. Yeah. A lot of times they can't. And what's happening a lot of the time, and it's going to sound funny, but it's true. Yeah. Eventually, the parents get sick of the adult children being at home. And if they have the means, I'm not kidding, they will give money to the, the adult children to help them get into the market. Um, and, and ironically, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. If all of us parents would just have the discipline for the next 10 years to not help our children buy their first house or condo, the market might, it might help the market stabilize a little bit, but that's not gonna happen. So. Blood is thicker than water. Indeed. Um, so it might sound crazy if anybody's been looking in anywhere in Toronto, even in the GTA, you see cranes, you see buildings going up, you know, one corner that you, you walked past for, for most of your life, uh, a month later you go by and it's just a hole in the ground. Yes, condos are going up. They're actually not coming up fast enough. Um, it might sound mind blowing. I'm going to share some numbers with you uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, hour or so. But here's something to consider. I don't have the exact number. I don't know, Florence, if you remember. But 15 years ago, if you were to buy, do a, a land assembly or buy a, a parking lot in downtown Toronto and you were to buy, build a condo, from buying that land to handing keys to the buyers, like they actually own the unit after closing, was somewhere in the six, seven years maximum. Now it's not unusual for it to take well over 10 years and sometimes even over 12 years. So you can imagine, sorry? It's absurd. Yeah. So you mean to say it takes 10 years for you to get your own, you say? Uh, it takes 10 years minimum these days for a develop any and on Eglinton here's a great example for a developer to buy a piece of land and take it through the development process. So everything from all of the architectural work, all of the zoning uh, checks, all of the pre-planning that you would do before you even ask the city uh, what you can build there, and then you start the negotiation with the city. It could be six months, it could be four years, if you want to really fight with them to get more units. I have a client that owns a property at the corner of Ossington and Bloor. We're just doing a six-story condo. Yeah. We started the job in two, 2013, and we just got the permit now. And that's, yeah, so that's and not that's even... because there was so much involved with the with dealing with development charges and dealing yeah. with the site plan approval processes and getting approvals from the neighbors and, and more. And the city is also getting hungry, too. They're looking for more... They're looking for more cash fee for things to do. So yeah. it, it's it's a vicious it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, and and what's happening in the in the larger uh, real estate and e economic cycle is important too. Um, a few years ago, when when properties uh, were appreciating in value so quickly, a lot of developers that I know were trying to get their product online quickly so that they could say, well, look, everything is selling. Uh, uh, everybody else is selling for a thousand dollars a square foot. And this is a few years ago. Um, a pre-construction, well, I'm the newest project, I'm going to sell for $1,100 a square foot. So they wanted to get it online quickly. When prices kind of leveled off and things went a little wonky in 2017, 2018, a lot of developers put the brakes on and said, whoa, 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 we don't like this dip in prices. We don't like the uncertainty in the market. And if we're able to, we're just going to hold off on, on launching or, or, or selling any projects uh, aggressively. So all of any, any blips like that, we feel it two, three, four, five, six years later um, when you're out shopping for a pre-construction condo and you're not finding a lot of supply. Sometimes it's those blips that have created that. Um, so I'll be coming back to this uh, a little later. No questions yet? Okay. Um, so the, the reality is pre-construction is the only option for some buyers in the GTA. And for those of you who don't know me well, um, there are a lot of realtors who will say, Pre-construction is fantastic. You should buy it as an investment. You should buy it for yourself. I'm actually not one of those. I actually, more often than not, I'll say pre-construction is not great for your situation that you've just described to me. It can be good, but a lot of the time I find it's not a good fit. And it's usually a one-on-one -on -one conversation to understand that. For those of you who don't know, I want to let you in on a little secret. In my industry, it's not a secret, but for you guys, it might, not, it might be. Um, there's a reason that many realtors push pre-construction. The reason is if you're buying resale, so let's say you want to buy a resale, an existing condo with me, my commission is going to be probably around two and a half percent. If you buy a pre-construction condo with me, the minimum will be 4%, sometimes 5%, sometimes 6%. So you can understand why a lot of realtors are pushing pre-construction. 
Um, so just be aware of that. If you are having a discussion with a realtor and they're really pushing pre-construction, challenge them and say, why do you think this is good for me, either as an investment or as a principal residence? And really, the, some of the only times that I think it's a good fit is if your, uh, resource, your financial resources are limited and you don't feel as though you have enough of a down payment to buy right now, but you feel the need to get your foot in the market. And it, is, it can be a little bit of a risk. Your, your deposit up to $20,000 is typically insured. Um, keep in mind, if you buy a townhouse at the base of a condo building, the deposit, it's very interesting. Developers are not allowed to use your deposit when you're buying a condo apartment pre-construction. Those funds go into a lawyer's trust account and they're able to, banks will lend against it, but developers can't use it or builders can't use it. If you buy a townhouse though, in that same development, your deposit is not insured and the developer can use it right away. So just be aware. It's so little things like that that you might not know if you're not doing this every day. Yes? Uh, out of curiosity, what's the, uh, <coughs> is there a particular range as far as like the age of the building that you would invest in as far as condos go? Because with older ones, you have to be cognizant of things like roof repair, which be a pretty hefty cost on that to the, the owner. So Great question. Do you like chocolate? <laughs> okay, that's a very good question. I hope you like white chocolate. Um, so my father used to toss uh, Ferrero Rochers um, when uh, at the course that I teach at U of T. Um, so this is almost the same size. Um, I don't really mind the age too much. It, the same thing as when people say, you know, what's the next hot area that I should buy in? I don't really look at it that way. I look at it on a per property basis, and if it if it makes sense for that, if that property makes sense for my situation as an investor. Um, then I'll go for it. So for example, age of building, I've seen buildings that are 30, 40 years old. They've been well run. Um, even though I'm not huge on, on a lot of regulation, there's some pretty strong regulation around uh, the onus that condo uh, boards uh, have to get certain things done. So there's certain engineering reports that they have to have done, certain audits they have to have done every so, no, so many years. And so when you buy a condo, usually within the last few years, there's been a, a report, a very in-depth study done that'll study uh, from an engineering perspective, physically the, build, the, the property, and then it'll look at the reserve fund and say, is there enough money over the next 10, 15, 20 years as elements come up for maintenance, large maintenance or improvement or replacement, is there enough money? And so I find that that's, the, the regulations are very strong around that. And so you usually have a pretty good idea when you're buying. So you could get that. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's called a status certificate. Um, oh. And when you're buying a, a condo, whether it's a, so a resale condo, almost every single uh, condo deal in Toronto is conditional on the buyer having the opportunity to review the status certificate. And actually, it's several hundred pages long, so you actually don't usually do the reviewing. Usually, you'd get your real estate lawyer to, to do the reviewing and, uh, and say, oh, this doesn't look right. You know, the ratio of how many units there are or what that, that study says is going to have to get done in seven or eight years, it doesn't jive with what I'm seeing in the status certificate. So... I've got some questions and, and you need to go find out from the property manager or the listing agent or the condo board what's going on. Um, most of the time it's okay. The other thing that you'll find in a status certificate is if there are any lawsuits against the corporation because you could be inheriting a portion of the liability and depending on the insurance policy that the condo corporation has, it may or may not cover off the totality of the liability. Yeah. Don't things like, <coughs> like insurance and property taxes have a direct correlation with the age of the property or, or, or is that more to do with the, with the property the... taxes not so much <coughs> property taxes less um, insurance possibly um, Jared would you know I haven't seen anything yeah I, I mean I, as a condo board we haven't seen anything other than yeah that. I mean as far as I know from an insurance perspective it would have to do with um, yes how likely a, a catastrophe is to occur but also has to do with uh, things like replacement value um, so it gets more expensive every day for any brick in the city of Toronto to be replaced um, than it was last year, right? So insurance numbers go up for, for pretty much across the board for things like that. Does that sort of answer your question? Um, as far as just to piggyback on that, whew, um, I will mention, that, so you were talking about condos. I will just mention quickly for freehold properties, I have clients who come to me and say, I want something brand new. I say, why? They say, because it's brand new. Um, my favorite, 
I, I actually like homes that are a little older. I like 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 year old homes. Um, I like the construction sometimes is a little more solid. Um, and it was, we weren't skimping as, scrimping as much on, uh, on uh, materials. Um, but uh, my favorite new age is from one to 10 ish. Uh, and the reason is I find that every new home, um, Jared and, and, and Lawrence, you guys might have experienced this or not. Um, every new home is settling. It, you have to go, especially in Canada, I find you have to go through a good uh, winter summer cycle for all the humidity and all the, 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 the dry air and the cold and the hot to see everything flexing and expanding and contracting. Um, so a lot of time I go into a home at zero years old, it looks great. And then my clients who often are not very handy will call and say, oh my gosh, there's a crack on the ceiling. And I come over and it's not a big deal. Uh, it's just paint or, or a drywall seam, um, but it's the house settling. Um, so anyway, for free fold. I mean, the only quick thing about, <coughs> about old versus new is, is that in the new homes now, there's core requirements for energy efficiency. They want a certain insulation value in, in, your, in your homes. Yep. You have to have a certain type of plumbing or, or a certain type of wiring in your home, whereas some of the older homes may have galvan, you know, have have the uh, there may be the galvanized lead iron piping, yep. or there could be there could be even knob and tube yep. or, or aluminum wiring, which you, you know is, is a fire hazard. So in those instances, you know that's where. But the older homes are built solid. In other words, you're going to get better quality of floor construction, subflooring. In some cases, you even get wood plank flooring as opposed to just plywood sheathing. So mm. you have to look, you have to weigh it out. But I yeah. think you have to, look, you have to look get an inspector. Yeah, exactly. Do you still have chocolate? I do. Oh, good. It's not good fashion. Yeah, so there's a few of them. You apparently do not have so much trust uh, to new stuff, and we are hearing frequently that uh, people are talking about whatever new materials, new way of living, uh, new innovations, whatever. That within a matter of ten years. Uh, houses or will be built from many new things or in very different way that we don't know even today. Mm -hmm. But it's apparently that many of those people are very confident. What's your opinion about that? What do you expect from them, if anything? I would agree. I mean, Jared would probably be well suited as well. Um, uh, but I would agree that there are some new technologies that are really great. I'm doing a big renovation right now where I'm hoping to use a lot of new material, new, new, new technologies. Um, as far as I know, I don't think spray foam was being used, you know, 30 years ago. Um, but it's got some of the best uh, insulation value or R value per inch um, of any other type of insulation. Um, heating and cooling systems that I'm looking at uh, are, are new. I'm putting a, a solar panel on, on this uh, system on this uh, roof. Um, I think you're motion sensor with devices. Yeah, I think you're gonna you're gonna see what's the um, What's the, 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 instead of a steel beam, what are, what are, what's being used now? What do you mean, the LDLs? Yeah. yeah. Uh, doors? Sorry? Auto doors? Composite material. Yeah, composites. Um, so there are some new technologies that are being used. Um, glide rock, glide, glide rock. Glide. Yeah, yeah, exactly, for sound insulation. Um, I think as well, what I think I've seen in my 20 years uh, doing this full time is a little bit, there was a, a housing boom where it was important to get product out quickly and builders were able to get away with that for a while. And, and people just started becoming more educated about what they should be asking for. And so builders, you know, large builders who have a good reputation and want to keep it are using better materials now, it seems to me. So I, I think you're right. I think we will see some interesting things uh, in the next- You mentioned solar panels and is city government or Ontario in support for sustainability or something? Incentive? There are some incentives, so, but they, they're going it's, down. It, it, it changes every year and, and depending on the government. But there are things that you need to know. For example, which I didn't know three months ago, thankfully I was able to do it in time. If you want any of these incentives around energy, increasing uh, uh, insulation, um, uh, any of that, before you do as any dem demolition, you have to do a home energy audit. If you take down a wall and you want to do your audit, you're out of luck. You've just lost out on five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars of of loans or grants. Um, and there, there actually are a ton of, uh, of programs. You really have to research them very carefully. I find a lot of people don't know about them enough. Um, and it's ironic. I mean, the, uh, uh, is it IESO? Has a program that incentivizes uh, rooftop uh, solar systems a little bit. Um, but the city of Toronto, when I contacted them, I was given the solar expert there. I called them and they're just, uh, even at the city of Toronto, the head, head person, um, I had a 45-minute conversation a few weeks ago, and 
And I asked him, I said, so are you the solar expert? He said, yes, but I'm not an expert. Uh, they don't even have a, a solar department. It just falls under the kind of energy efficiency uh, at the city of Toronto. And when I asked him if he wanted to collaborate on my project, he said something like the last project that they actually were involved in was 2016. In the city, size of the city of Toronto, the last project that they actually were physically involved in to help somebody was 2016. So it, it, you have to roll up your sleeves and do it yourself, is what I've been finding. Yes? So regarding new constructions, um, like, I, I don't know if the terminology is right, is it assignments? Yes. Um, are there any hidden costs associated to, to something like that? Are you talking about primarily for condos? Pre-construction. Uh, just so right after construction, you're in that like first first year, um, but it hasn't fully handed over. Right. So uh, you're yeah. referring to interim occupancy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just so everybody knows, a, a deal. Uh, most people talk only about pre-construction condo assignments. So that's when um, somebody gets a contract with a builder. You can buy this property for five hundred thousand dollars in three, four, five years. Whenever I deliver it to you. You give me five hundred thousand dollars, and you get the property, um, even if it's worth at that point seven hundred thousand. Your contract's for five hundred thousand. So sometimes some enterprising minds uh, will say, hmm, "I've got this paper. It says I can. I have the right to buy that for five hundred thousand. It's now worth seven hundred thousand. I lost my job. I can't even qualify for a mortgage, so I can't close on this anyways. So I'm going to lose my deposit, or I just want to make some money on an investment. I'm going to sell this paper to somebody else for six hundred fifty thousand. So they save a little bit of money, and I make a bunch of money on, on the investment, on, on, on selling the paper. So <coughs> what I want to just mention is assignment sales are permitted for any type of property. It doesn't happen very often, but I just want you guys to understand, like you can look for opportunities, and there are opportunities, um, to buy properties other than pre-construction condos at below market value. You have to make sure that that <coughs> right to assign is in the original contract? My understanding, and not a real estate lawyer, so I would, I would kick it over to a real estate lawyer. Last time I spoke with mine, um, no, you can, the buyer or the assign, assignor can uh, do, sign what's called an irrevocable direction to close to their lawyer yeah. to close in a different name than what's on the paper. <coughs> Assignment um, is not uh, legally binding, right? Of course it is. Contract. Yes, contract. definitely. Contract. Now, it, it comes down to contract law. So if the contract says, if the developer's contract says, you may not assign this contract, and you sign saying, I accept that, then you're going to have some, some, a harder time assigning it. Um, but that's very... But if you can do a direction, it's not an assignment. Exactly. So it's, it's usually workable to get around it. Um, but for example, developers who don't want you to assign, they're just going to say, you cannot advertise this on the MLS. So then it becomes very difficult to find somebody who wants to buy your specific unit um, for more money than you paid for it. So coming back to your question, uh, it was about hidden costs. Yeah. The only thing I can really think of, so if it's a, uh, with a developer, a lot of developers will say, you know, you, you can assign, but you're paying me a thousand or two thousand or five thousand okay. dollars. Right? So it's a, they know that five, ten, twenty percent of units in the, in the development are going to be assigned. So why not make a few thousand dollars on each assignment? So that's one, one thing. The other thing is like I sell assignment properties. So if you have a, a property, you say, look, I have a really good price. It's worth more. I'm happy to give somebody a good deal and I'll still make money. If I'm involved as a broker, I'm going to charge a commission. So you have to be aware of that. And then lastly, uh, and I'm not going to go down this road because it's an accountant CRA question, um, but uh, many accountants will tell you and CRA has started going after that assignment fee. Number one, it's income. Number two, um, uh, sorry, number one, it may be income. Number two, HST is applicable is what I've understood. Is that what you were looking for? Yeah. Okay. So that's different than interim occupancy. That's the same. No, assign, assignment is assignment. Assigning, okay. assigning a contract is before you pay the money to the builder and you get your keys yeah. and you're l registered in the land registry office as the owner on title, anytime before that, if you sell, it's an assignment. You're assigning your contract. Thank you. Good? Okay. Um, <coughs> Yeah, like, yeah, I knew you would keep me keep me honest. <coughs> um, so, 
one thing to keep in mind is, uh, uh, so a lot of my clients will say, look, I don't know if I want a condo or condos in Toronto are too expensive. I want to get outside of Toronto. Well, a lot of younger uh, buyer clients of mine are saying, the product that's available within my budget is crap outside of Toronto. The newer stuff, you know, half an hour, an hour, even an hour and 15 minutes from Toronto, it's, it's the stuff that my parents would buy, is what I hear a lot. And, and as I've written here, sorry, you may not be able to read this all, but you know, usually there are not a lot of amenities that are walk, walking distance. You're buying houses typically three, four bedrooms. A lot of the time they're designed to appeal to you know, millennials' parents' generation. A big two-car garage, impressive looking. Um, a lot of millennials will look at that and say, that's not my dream and I'm not interested in that product. Uh, so the type of product sometimes is, is that's being offered in the price range of first-time buyers is not appropriate. So I'm just giving you guys an idea of, again, this is still the overview section, believe it or not. Um, so this is just kind of setting the stage for, for where things are and where they have been. What about millennium? What uh, type of property are they? <coughs> Condos? Or? Condos, and if they're freehold, usually smaller properties. So not, you know, 2,000, 2,500 square feet. Um, one or two bedrooms. That's why townhouses for a while were quite popular. Smaller footprint. Um, yes, they had stairs, but that just meant you didn't have to go to the gym every day. Yeah. You had a question. Same question. Okay. Um, so yes. Well, they they are lower uh, if you if you get out out of the city, you get into the uh, into the suburbs, into new subdivisions. A lot of the time, those properties are going to be quite a bit less expensive than in Toronto or closer to Toronto. Um, I don't think I don't know if this is where you're going. If the angle is, is there an opportunity there? I don't really think that there is. Um, developers are moderately aware of this, but a lot of the developers and builders, I'm just going to be co- completely direct. A lot of the people who are running the show are, are, are men between the ages of 60 and 80 years old. That's just a fact. So it's going to take another 10 or 15 years, I think, for a lot of the builders and developers to bring in new, new thoughts and new ideas. And even the largest uh, builders and developers, the biggest names you know of, a lot of the time it's still one or two or, or a handful of people who are running the show, who are making the final decision saying, this is what we do. You know, you have somebody who comes to them and says, yeah, I think we could make more money if we built the product that was more appealing to da, da, da. No, no, no. This is what we do. This is what we've always done. I've been in those meetings. It's, it's odd. <laughs> also, it depends. Like, if there's newcomers to Canada and if there's a certain, <coughs> like, uh, I would say an ethnic pool or some people that want to come in and they want to be in that neighborhood. Or there's people that are coming, coming from out of province. Some people, they will, like, the GTA is a magnet to draw for its an economic hub. So people come are going to come in here and they'll they'll look for something that's even outside the Toronto core because it's an opportunity to get into the into the marketplace. So you have to look at some that factor too. Yeah, true. So we're going to get into some driving forces. So this is <coughs> just a table of contents and uh, and I'll get into it right away. Um, so uh, has anybody heard of um, oh what was the term? Was it? Renters Nation? Renter Nation? Is that what it was? A few years ago, and then there was a big article about it. And, and I really do believe we are, you can be happy or sad about it. It doesn't matter. I don't think any one of us can stop it or change it too much. In, in 20 years, Toronto will look a lot more like New York City than it does now. Or, um, or most of Europe. Yeah, it, it, that's a good point. Um, so we're definitely headed in that direction. It sounds like everybody here wants to be one of the landlords, not one of the tenants at that time. Um, so that's a good thing already. Um, but this is the reality. Um, so I've got a bunch of information here. If anybody wants this, because I don't, I literally don't like to read from slides during presentations. I think it kind of insults people's intelligence. And some of you might not be able to see this at the back. If you'd like a copy of this, uh, let me know, and I'll uh, and I'll get it to you so you can digest it slowly. Um, we only put about 30 hours of research into this uh, presentation, so there, there should be some pretty good, accurate numbers to to um, to engage with. <clears throat> Um, just to give you an idea, a lot of people are, aren't able to find the right information online. Um, uh, but I just wanted to show you that, that for new townhouses and new condos, this is the price trend. And townhouses are interesting because they're kind of an odd duck between pure freehold, like single family detached, and condo apartment units. 
And so if I had room for the, the, the new or freehold property, you'd see an even bigger dip uh, towards the end of uh, uh, middle to end of 2017 uh, in the values. Um, but just to give you an idea, condos really, um, they were slightly affected, but not so much in the last four years in comparison to even just townhouses, how much they were affected in uh, mid to late 2017. Does that, does that include for stackable townhouses too? I don't, I don't remember when I was generating this, uh, um, Lawrence. I don't remember. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, new condo, January 2016, we were around $326,000, $27,000. And now November 2019, we're at about five fifty. dollars Four years. Um, and I don't remember if I get into it in this presentation, but my, my belief is that um, condos under a million dollars, especially under $800,000 in Toronto are going to appreciate. It's going to be one of the asset classes that appreciates the fastest over the next few years. <coughs> so um, I don't like to get into things uh, too much of a, of a, on a global scale, but just because I wanted to share all the factors that could influence where the market's going to be going next year, I wanted to get into, there is a, a threat of a recession. Um, uh, many economists who I think have their feet planted firmly on the ground. Those of you who don't know me, a lot of economists, I think they're kind of floating, you know, kind of in a Zen, you know, position, lotus above the ground. They don't really, they're not really in tune with what's happening on the ground. There are a few economists, Benjamin Tal is one that I like, um, who've got their feet on the ground. And those economists feel that even if we were to enter a recession, and Canada has been flirting with recession for the last six months, from what I remember, um, the GTA real estate market should not be much affected. Can do your own research. Um, I could probably talk five hours about that, um, but uh, just to give you guys an idea, that's why I'm not too too worried. This is, this is my question. So I, I believe that we will have <coughs> a fairly major recession mm -hmm. in the not too distant future. So are you saying that things will not go up as quickly, but they're not going to go backwards? Is that what you're I saying? think what we'll probably experience is similarly to what we did a couple years ago. So certain uh, asset classes will skate by. Um, not not appreciating strongly, but just skate by, and then others will have a correction, whether it's five percent or twenty percent. I don't know. Um, what I've always found a little bit humorous is, and, and this is when you're re removed, you're not talking about your own home, but you're looking at the market in general. Is I remember, um, I think it was from 2016 to 2017. There was one year where Aurora, on average, the homes there appreciated by 50.1 or 50.2 percent. Does anybody remember that number? something crazy, literally one year to the next, 50% appreciation. And then the next year it lost 20% and people were screaming in the streets. Um, you know, there is a concept of easy come, easy go. Um, so, so what I prefer to, I still remember 1990. I've heard about it. Yeah. You've heard of it. My father. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's a, I don't have the chart here, but there is something very interesting Vivian, can I borrow your book? Yeah. I have a copy of it here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see if I can remember where this is. Appreciate it in 25 to 28. I promise this is not a plug for my book. Okay. So. This is um, a chart that we created using real data from 1966 to 2005, okay? The bars indicate um, percentage of appreciation per year increase, and the, the jagged line is, uh, is the price. So a little bit like the chart I just had a, a couple slides ago. So what's interesting is um, 86, 87, 88, no, 87, 88, 89, 90, you had for sorry, three years in a row, you had 20 plus percent appreciation. Three years in a row. Um, and that was just absolutely unsustainable. And, and when I say three years in a row, the last year was 19%. So almost four years in a row of 20 plus percent appreciation. That's unsustainable. Um, we haven't had, uh, especially in the last couple of years, a lot of steam has been let out of, market, out of the market. There's more steam building, but this is what I've always kept my eye on. Right. 20 plus percent from three years or more, disaster is coming for sure. So should 75% of homeowners. Say again? So should 75% of homeowners. So should they what? Thank you. They should be looking at the, 
be a watch for the rates. Yeah, absolutely. Because some people are living beyond their means and uh, they're relying on home equity as a as a reason. I have neighbor, I have neighbors who uh, a couple of years ago, all of a sudden, three adults in the house have brand new luxury cars, and they don't have the jobs for those cars. And I know where the money came from. So yeah, um, so something to keep in mind. Also, <laughs> this all this is driven by the interest rate. No. So if the interest rate goes up, yes. then it's going to affect the It's a little rate. bit more complicated than that. Uh, employment is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest factors. Cash flow. Um, yeah. Employment is a massive, massive uh, indicator of what's coming. Um, so I, I like to look at, at employment numbers. I agree with you that interest rates do drive to a certain extent. Um, but for example, commercial real estate, if we're talking about investments in general, commercial real estate always tags long, usually a couple years behind residential. So they react, it reacts less quickly to interest rate fluctuations. Um, <coughs> I agree with you that if interest rates were to rise quickly, that there'd be some problems. Yeah, there definitely because, and second thing, the interest rate doesn't, doesn't depend on Canada. We don't have control. It's all about the U.S. If the interest to rate some goes extent, up yeah. There, automatically we have to raise the interest rate. Yeah, but you got to a certain extent. Yes. Thank the banks here because if we didn't handle things the way we did with banking here, with with qualified for mortgage and all that stuff, we'd be we would be in a bigger mess. Inter but interestingly, you know, there was uh, I should find this article. I have it somewhere. In two thousand and eight, um, Canada was on the uh, global scale, it being praised at how stable a banking system it has, um, when things were going an, a nightmare in the states. So. That's actually, I actually talked at that point about the U.S. and Canada having a, a, a divorce. Um, we're still very much, I agree with you, can, U.S. is the locomotive and we're one of the cars that usually gets pulled along with it. Um, but we've sort of grown up a little bit in, in the right in, uh, climate uh, to be able to stand on our own and not completely follow, be dragged along by it. Uh, yes. So if there, is a, <coughs> if there is a recession, that leads to opportunity, correct? Theoretically, it also depends on on the scope, like how the scope so, of the recession. So, so if, if I don't know if you're going to get there, but if, if there is a recession, then there are certain classes of, of properties that will take a dip or mm -hmm. flatten, and it might be a good time to, to invest because it will reverse. I don't I don't go there here so much, okay. Okay. but usually if there's a, a strong recession, there's opportunity in most asset classes. Yeah. But when you say to a certain extent, we're, we're kind of living in a little bit of a false economy in as much as that a lot of buyers are still being driven by by, by emotion as, as opposed to uh, intellect. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we find out we've got a new LRT coming in. There's new Go, go Transit line going now from Niagara Falls mm -hmm. right down to Golden Horseshoe. So now people are now looking to find Stony Creek and mm -hmm. other areas of St. Catharines where they never did before. So it's the optimism and hope of new transit system and new infra infrastructure. I might as well buy here because when this gets built, my home will be worth more value. I might as well buy. It. But it's but it's also pragmatic to a certain degree because I have these conversations with real buyers, and so it's pragmatism sometimes where somebody says, "Look, right now I'm driving an hour, um, but if I buy in this area, I decide to put down roots. I stop renting. I buy wherever I am: Stony Creek, Barry, Newmarket, wherever it is. Instead of driving an hour each way, I'll be taking uh, uh, public transit for half an hour." If there's a good hub that's now running well or, or is expected to run well in the next five years. But I agree with you. There are speculators. I'm not a big fan of speculation. A lot of what I'm going to talk about here is not speculation. Um, if, you, if you like to speculate, please go to the casino. And you'll probably spend less than what you would on a, on a house or a condo. Yes? <laughs> on the subject of speculation, you know, I just wanted to kind of bring in two things here. Uh, it, the process of buying a house in a supply constrained market. <coughs> bidding. To and a certain extent, yeah. Of bidding is blind. Yes, it is. Don't know. Yeah. How is it different from speculation? Because I really do. Because what is happening here in this market is people want to buy at any cost. And so the, that is the reason why I think there is a certain proportion of the graph that we showed. That is the reason why prices are going so high. Mm -hmm. If it's an open market like in Australia or you know where everybody knows, you know, there are some Twenty people bidding on a property. Yep. and you know what they're bidding. Yes, yep. I just you know put a thousand dollars more. Why I I, I agree with you, but respectfully, whether I agree with you or, or I don't, it doesn't really matter. The reality is this is happening, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. I believe there's a change coming, and there's a new rule now 
or a new um, um, act or something passed, which says that the buyer, no, the seller has the right to disclose whether all the uh, yes, are I think that's been proposed. I think it's been proposed. Yes. I don't think it's in in place yet, um, but I agree that it's it's been proposed. And I would art. I would postulate that most sellers, with guidance from their listing agents, I'm not saying I agree with them, but most of them are going to not do what you just right. what they're they're going to be allowed to do. Right. The same thing. Uh, opening up sales data was supposed to revolutionize and put every realtor out of business. Didn't happen. I don't think that that change is going to, it's a step in the right direction, very much so. Maybe one day we'll have open, properly open bidding and that'll be the law. I don't know. Um, but it's interesting. Nobody ever complained about this until about 12, 15 years ago. In a normal market, in a balanced market, I mean, I remember it was normal for a property to take three months to sell. Now, if a realtor hasn't sold in 10 days, they come to me and go, what do I do? It's been on the market for 10 days and nobody's made an offer. Um, it's truly. So uh, before this time, it was normal. And you'd, you'd run your sales. Same old school brokers, we still do the same work as we used to, which is you run your sales comparables. You say, okay, property A looks a lot like property B. Um, so if it sold in the last month for X dollars and they're very similar finishes, age, construction quality, layout, design, number of bedrooms, finished basement, lot size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're in close proximity without any neighborhood uh, amenities or, or, or negative influences on either one, then this property is worth pretty much what that property is, or what it just sold for. Um, where I think that there's a big problem is how, and this is a deep hole to go down, but I'll just say it quickly. <coughs> where I think there's a problem is, um, Realtors are incentivized a certain way. So if I'm if I'm representing a buyer, um, I have to. I mean, people who work with me find this out eventually, and and buyers they have to make up their mind if they trust it or not. But I am I get excited. I get a kick out of saving my clients money. And if they pay ten thousand dollars more, two, what is it two hundred and fifty dollars in my pocket? I don't care about that. What I care about is knocking it out of the park with them. So they talk to 10 people and say, you wouldn't believe what this guy just did. But it's unusual, and I'm not, I'm not the only one, that's not what I'm saying. But the problem is the vast majority of realtors, they're not incentivized. If, and especially if their client tells them, well, I could pay up to 700, but I'd really rather keep it to 650. Unfortunately, most of these realtors, now in their head, they've got, eh, they can pay up to 700. So they're not gonna fight very hard. Whereas, I like to think I, some of us uh, do things a little differently where if our client says 700, but you know, my life's going to be difficult if I buy for more than 650. I don't want to get a phone call from my client in six months saying, I can't pay my bills because you allowed me to pay 680. Now they still sign in everything. You know, I, I even t have a deal sometimes with buyer clients. I say, look, tell me what, I know that you can afford more, but for this property, tell me what your maximum is now and send me an email saying, Claude, I want you to hold me to this. Because it's too emotional and, and the consultants or the service providers are reverse incentivized. There's not an incent a financial incentive for me to get a low price. So I agree with you. If that you were sort of talking about what's wrong with the market, that part I really don't like. That's not good. But I can't do anything about it other than do what I think is right. So it, it, it is frustrating. For those of you who, who didn't follow right off the bat, um, in Australia, they have a system where you, sometimes you'll just st stand on the front lawn of the property that's being sold, and it's in its auction style. Wow. So you actually hear and know what somebody is bidding. So somebody says, "I'll pay 410." You say, "Well, I'll pay 425." So there's none, nobody's going to say all of a sudden, "I'll pay 600 <laughs> when somebody just said 425. But I think the point was the current market where it's blind, and you know you put in offers, nobody's allowed to. Realtors are not allowed to share or are not supposed to share what other people are, are bidding. Um, you might pay 600 if, if you know, your, your, your partner at home said, we've, we've missed out on five properties in the last two months. Get back. Don't come home tonight if you don't have a house to come with. Uh, I've heard this before. So, and, that, and that puts extreme pressure and people do silly things. So I want to keep moving on. So threat of recession we talked about. Um, there are some preventative policies that the Canadian government is working on. 
not going to dive into it too much. Um, Benjamin Tao, I will mention because I, I don't fully agree with him that, uh, that the government should stick their finger in it and their nose in it again and make it harder to borrow. Um, I'm not sure I, I agree. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of economy and employment. And the more you restrict people from borrowing, um, uh, especially people who are business owners, and a lot of people these days are business owners or independent contractors, it makes life very difficult. <laughs> so one of the things that he's proposed is that um, to raise the minimum down payment on homes between 500,000 and a million um, to more than 10%. Because right now, with insurance, with mortgage insurance, you can buy with only ten percent down. Um, so this is what uh, what he's proposing. Um, <coughs> this is just something I wanted to throw in there. Um, I don't really rely on it too too much uh, because you know re re when you say real estate executives, I'm hearing investment bankers uh, looped in there as well. Of course, they're going to be mostly optimistic. They want things to go up, um, uh, but it was it was somewhat interesting that only six percent. We're predicting that 2020 would be a poor, uh, a poor or failing year. I think 2020 will be good. Uh, what I predict is what I think. 2021, that's when the problem will start. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Um, possibly, but I, I, I'm, I'm reserving judgment because you know, middle of next year, some things will probably have happened in the world and in and locally to to guide you know. No, what we think my is going to happen. Prediction in what I the U.S. election is going to take place, right? Yeah. So everything is going to be calm to sure. the election. Yeah. Once I, I the election agree. is over, then they start the new policy yeah. or the interest rate may go up or down. But till then, you know, everything will be, you yeah. know, nothing is going to change. I agree. I agree in general. 25% today. Sorry? At 69, you got at 6, but what about the other Yeah, person? I don't I don't know. Maybe they abstained from, uh, they were, I, I don't, I want to wait and see. They're hiding. Yes. The that diagram that you had shown from the book, yes. how does that correlates with such statements? Uh, but that's his, that's historical yes, data. And historically, statements of such people. Ah, were, I did not spend enough hours finding the correlation between <laughs> between predictions so or what, statements. What was the appreciation over the last two or three years? Uh, on an annual basis? I don't remember. I've got a few numbers coming up. Yeah. What I know is that when we did the work for the book, 66 to, what was it, 2001 or so, um, uh, the average appreciation in Toronto of a freehold property was 7.14%. And that was before the extreme, whatever you want to call it, appreciation or prosperity that we've just experienced. I like to use 6% if I'm running numbers for anybody um, over a long enough period of time. <laughs> So, <coughs> uh, just talking a little bit more about instability, and um, uh, again, I'm happy to send this out to anybody who'd like to take a look. The fourth big driver um, uh, that we're experiencing is population growth. Um, here you've got a high scenario, a reference scenario, and a low scenario. So in the low scenario, by 2046, we'd be at uh, just over 17 million um, uh, up from... Um, Sorry, historical here, projected. Uh, no, that's wrong. But I think that's wrong. That number is wrong. Really big factor. Say again. Population is a big factor. I, full, I fully agree. So let me just read this chart. So uh, the low scenario, we're at uh, currently at 6.8. Ontario versus GTA. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I don't know why we've got GTA in here. Um, you're right, sorry. This is Ontario. Thank you for reminding me. Sometimes when you're close up, you can't even read. Um, so this chart references Ontario. Um, and uh, over here, we're just talking about the GTA. The Ontario scenario is currently at 14.8 uh, or so, 14.5. The low scenario being just over 17 uh, million. The median projected around 20 million and the highest scenario being about 23 million in, uh, in Ontario in 46. <coughs> um, so uh, just want to talk quickly about immigrant population um, or net migration to, to the GTA. Um, you can read through all of this. Um, basically, the numbers that I like to look at are uh, 300 to 350,000 uh, newcomers to Canada a year. Uh, usually about a third of them end up in the GTA. That's huge. 100 to 130,000 on average uh, uh, end up in the GTA every single year. And we bring on board 10 to 15,000 new condos every year. Doesn't work. No. 
Yeah, but that's uh, go ahead. The thing is that the government is not planning well, right? Oh, I agree when with you. They are creating a situation. Yeah. It's not done by justice. Everything is planned. Yeah. They are creating a shortage so that the the demand and supply everything in economic is supply and demand. Yeah, I agree. So they are creating a short supply of supply that is creating a you know Shoot. people are chasing Absolutely. You know, so many people are chasing few properties. Yeah. So it's bound to rise. Of course. Absolutely. And this will keep on that's going. one of the big takeaways tonight. That's the main, that's the main thing. Yeah. yeah. That's two chocolates. Yeah. What? Two chocolates. That was a question. That was a statement. <laughs> um, student population, <laughs> to, your, to your being here. Um, uh, we have a, a fantastic post secondary uh, uh, student population from abroad in the GTA. Um, for those of you who don't know, I don't know if you guys remember, but I remember growing up thinking that U of T was the only real post-secondary education in, in, in the GTA. Um, now we've got some massive, massive powerhouse uh, uh, institutions between Ryerson, U of T, uh, and new campuses all the time, uh, York, uh, and those are the close, close, close ones. Um, the next slide is also about this. So 460,000 students um, enrolled in universities and colleges. In Toronto, um, that's a that's a serious yeah. chunk of people. Yeah. Sorry, Cur yeah, uh, no, no, this is just enrolled. Oh, okay. So four hundred sixty thousand enrolled. Oh, yeah. So a lot of them, like we said earlier, are staying at home with mom and dad. Um, those who don't have family nearby are renting or buying units. Um, and this is just a segment. It's it's important, but it's not. Uh, it's like it drives me crazy when I when I people try to justify the. The rise in prices of, of properties say, oh, it's foreign money. It's such a simplistic blanket statement to make. It's one of the segments, yeah. but so is natural population growth, so is international students, so is post secondary education. Especially draw. In Hamilton, I've seen that <coughs> whole area is a big university in Hamilton. Yes, that's right. So uh, you know, a lot of people have bought places. All L large universities are, are transforming whole towns and small cities. Truly. Well, the other thing too is some of these colleges are transforming to universities because that gives them right. the mechanism to charge more tuition. Yes, case. that's right. So it's 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 it's, an, it's a cost factor. Yeah. No, there's an incentive for sure. Um, <coughs> does anybody know about the stress testing uh, changes that happened a couple of years ago? So the the short story is um, the government said that. <laughs> If you're buying a property with a federally regulated financial institution, so basically the big banks, let's just use it that way, say say it that way, um, you had to, if the interest rate that you of the product you were interested in was three percent, the bank would have to run your numbers, your income, and your affordability at five percent. The idea being, well, if you can afford to buy this in our numbers when it's five percent, then at three percent, of course you're okay, and in the next few years, if interest rates rise you still should be okay. So they're building in a, a buffer there of, uh, of homeowners who have been pre-vetted to as long as their employment stays the same um, and there are no major health issues and stuff like that, they're pre-vetting a whole layer of homeowners who've, uh, who've passed the test. That if interest rates rise, they're not going to have to panic and sell. They're not going to not be able to afford their property. Sorry? Yes, very much so, yes. Now, the thing that a lot of people don't know, I find, is that um, is what we call the alternative market. So B, B20 only applied to federally regulated institutions. So provincially regulated inst financial institutions like credit unions have flexibility and they don't have to follow all these rules. Is that clear so far? The other thing I want to mention, and I don't think I talk about it in writing here, <coughs> is that the magic number is, it, to me is a million dollars. And the reason is, and I, and I often say, it's 20 times easier for me to sell a home for $999,000 than it is for a million and one dollars. The reason is, as soon as your purchase price, not the amount of money that you're borrowing, but the purchase price of the property, as soon as it's a million dollars or more, there's a mandatory 20% down and stress, all types of stress testing kicks in. Um, I've literally done creative deals with sellers where you said, they want about a million, a million, five thousand, a million, ten thousand. But we need the agreement of purchase and sale to be at nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand dollars because it transforms the the funding model for that for that buyer. Is the stress test for <coughs> like prices above five hundred K or is it for any mortgage? It's for federally regulated institutions. Right. 
I believe it's anything that's not insured under a million dollars as well. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, because you can put less than 20% down and you can, even if you have 20% down, if you're in a certain category of type of borrower and there are tons of different categories, a lender may not be comfortable lending to you, like even some self-employed individuals who make good money, but the certain a certain lender looks at that category a certain way. Um, one way to satisfy them is to get mortgage insurance. So it costs you something, there's a premium to it, um, but you can then borrow the money. <coughs> sorry? I'm sorry? What percentage is done? I don't remember. I want to say it's half a percent to one percent, something like that. It makes a difference, especially for, I had a client I was talking to who bought a property for $450,000 and his premium was $18,000. He said, you know, it was surprising to me. I didn't, I hadn't saved up that kind of money. He managed to make it work. It wasn't with me. It was years ago. Um, I've been playing with this too much. There we go. Um, so here are just interest rate predictions. I'm not a mortgage agent, obviously. I hope it's obvious. Um, but the expectation is that the Bank of Canada, it's generally thought, will uh, cut rates. Uh, fixed interest rates should uh, remain on average below 3% um, for all of 2020. That's the expectation. Um, home values across Canada. I don't know how much you guys care about that here. You're probably more interested in the GTA. Um, and uh, uh, there, there really are not a lot of incentives right now or not enough incentives for first-time home buyers um, to almost compensate or make up for the fact that, you know, uh, who said it, or Kim, I think you were saying earlier, uh, the dis this disparity between earning, no, Lawrence, between earning and, and, and price of a first property that you're buying. What is the thing about Alberta? Any idea, like, is it a good time to buy because I heard the property market is really bad? Like that. That's terrible. I think, this is going to sound cute, but I think a good time to buy is any time, depending on the situation. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit when we get into the U.S. Um, to, to me, it's less about areas and it's more about the property and the situation itself. Um, if the seller's motivated, I love it when I see properties that have been listed and relisted and relisted five, six, seven, ten times in the last two years. Either the seller's stubborn about something and maybe one day they're going to break or they have a listing agent who has no idea and they're just pricing it at $700,000 one day, $950,000 next week, and then six ninety nine dollars another, another week. Literally, I see that regularly. Um, so to me, it doesn't really matter where it is. I'm serious. I think I sent you something like that tonight, Danius, uh, on a property. Oh, you haven't read it? Yeah. So there's one where I say, I literally listed it in the last three months, five times, and the numbers just go like this. So traditionally, it's never been like in the winter time, it's whether it's a buyer's market or a, or a seller time, more of a seller's market. So that's an interesting, oh no, you don't want chocolate. I forgot. Um, uh, that's an interesting question. So traditionally in, in the GTA, or at least for the 20 years that I've been at it, um, our, our winters have had a cooling effect on the, on the real estate market. That hasn't been true really for the last three years or so. And it really comes back. We, you've talked about it, <laughs> maybe, but also it has a lot to do. It's just supply and demand. And we're going to, we're going to get there. Um, but that's, if that's the biggest takeaway, maybe it's too simplistic for some of you, but really everything that I'm talking about, it all boils down to supply and demand. It really is that simple. <coughs> For those of you who might be looking for uh, asset classes outside of residential, um, office downtown Toronto is uh, on an absolute tear and it looks likely to be that way uh, for a while. Probably most of us are not going to be buying or developing office towers downtown, um, but there are interesting ways to invest in, in some of these properties such as REITs. Uh, so it's almost like a stock market uh, or shares for real estate investment companies. There are a lot of office specific ones uh, out there. Um, uh, one thing that's interesting, considering my background is commercial real estate to start with, um, when all these towers that you saw going up downtown in the last seven, eight years, office towers, uh, and look closely, you can usually tell if it's an office tower or a condo tower. Um, there are a lot of them that have gone up. And what's interesting, they've added millions and millions of square feet of, of leasable office space to the market. What's really interesting is most of that is pre-leased. Pre-leased. All that space, the towers that are going up that are not finished, the space is spoken for for the most part. And you can, this is not a secret. You can find it online. But that's unbelievable. So that, that really uh, tells you about the demand that there is and the economic engine that's that's turning in Toronto. Well, it kind of works like the residential condo market. They don't. They usually won't allow a builder to build until they have at least 75% sales, the yeah. banking financing. And probably works in the same manner with the office space. Like in, in, some, in some buildings, that's the case. But I've seen buildings that go up without that. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so office space, and then industrial. It's actually one of my my pet favorites. Um, uh, again, maybe not in the in the cards to buy large warehouses, uh, but I just w did want to mention that industrial really has been doing quite well for the last few years. I expect that to continue uh, to be the case, and for if anything, for that to increase. Um, part of it has to do. It's not again blanket statements. It's not all e-commerce. Um, there's still some small manufacturing. Um, some small assembly that, that gets done. Warehousing is, is very much necessary. Um, but e-commerce does have some uh, uh, impact on the industrial space market. Um, anyway, just something to keep in mind. One thing that I don't think is disappearing, but there's definitely been a shift that started and will continue for the next 10 years is the retail space. Um, you're seeing a lot of retail spaces that used to be evidently used just for stores, you know, selling goods. A lot of them are being converted to um, uh, co-working spaces or uh, offices for dentists, lawyers, accountants, architects, etc. So a lot of street fronts are being transformed and no longer kind of walk-in traffic. They're becoming more destinations. And the biggest tip that I have for you if you're involved in that in any way is if, if you're a destination, so a service provider where people have to come to, as opposed to they're just walking down the street, oh, I want a can of Coke and I'm going to walk into the convenience store, is um, you have to be accessible. So it has to, it's either you know your clientele is going to be coming with public transit or you have parking uh, available. Because service providers on major arteries usually do not have parking or enough of it available. Yeah, sorry, Claude, I know you got a lot to yeah. um, I know in, in my industry as, as an architect too, we've, we've had situations where we have major national companies in the U.S., have migrated to the Canadian market because of the exchange rate and things of yeah. that sort. So that's also been driving the population of people buying more industrial spaces or office spaces because for that for that purpose as well. So I agree. I that would throw them with your presentation. I, I fully agree. I mean, you have uh, a lot of American companies like GM recently closed down in Oshawa. It's, it's a big time for your, your, your defense, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So to your point on the uh, service provider, so if you were like, doing like, a walk-in rental connected after a dentist, between like being, let's say, like, for like, subway stop mm -hmm. or having parking, what, what would you say would you base it on? Is it, is it, is it an urban center that's downtown? Sure. So, like, yeah. What would you, if you were going to, let's say, buy like a major office, would you base your criteria on accessibility or on like, I'm going to try to answer that a little differently. A couple of years ago, I had a client, a physiotherapist, who was opening space downtown. And what she would do is she, her, her main clientele, she had built up over the years. They were going to come in from the suburbs to see her if they really wanted to see her. So she needs some accessibility and, and parking. But her main clientele, she was planning on servicing all of the office towers. And so she would actually go to office towers and ask who their preferred physiotherapy uh, service provider was. And that's how she kind of zeroed in on, there was one space that she really liked, I remember, um, but there were so many physiotherapists peppered out throughout some of the buildings. That she said, there's too much competition. So we went to another area. Um, I don't know if I, would, if I could say accessibility versus parking. Um, there, some people believe that park uh, driving is, is dramatically on the decline, that the government's going to, the municipal government's trying to get us to stop driving completely. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Um, I think people's habits are changing, um, especially with new offerings like you know Uber and Lyft. I, I think a lot of people, like in my business, it's very, very, very difficult to go to five different houses to show them using Uber. It's very, very difficult. Um, it's difficult for pizza delivery um, to, to park out front if there's not a parking spot out back to, to load up or to wait between calls. So I think, I think there are still times where, where parking is gonna be necessary. Um, something for you to keep in mind. So a little bit like office space, you know, if we're talking about senior residences and things like that, I mean, those are big, big, big ticket items that, that we're probably not all buying in this room. But at the same time, you can either invest in senior living through uh, funds and REITs that specialize in, in offering that type of housing to seniors. Um, and you can also keep it in mind, if you have a duplex, a triplex, um, depending on how you're designing like a ground floor unit, depending on how accessible you're making it, you could be servicing a market here. A lot of the time, and I'm guilty of this too, 
if I'm doing a renovation, I think, oh, you know, what's a young professional want, right? Okay, so I'm gonna put in a smart thermostat, some cool cameras, um, some digital doohickeys and, and gadgets that are gonna make them excited. Um, but this is a market that's going to be, that's booming uh, over the next couple of decades. So I just wanna plant the seed for you to not ignore it. And I'm reminding myself not to ignore this demographic. So biggest takeaway, like I was saying, is, is really the imbalance in, in supply and demand. Um, <coughs> so it's, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, it, it, it seems likely that unlike uh, previous generations, uh, millennials, a large part of, the, of that generation, will be renting forever. Um, it's just a fact, doesn't make me happy, but it is what it is. Um, and for those of you who track uh, low vacancy rates, um, they are still, five years ago we were saying they're historically low, they're still historically low and even lower. Um, we're as close to 0% vacancy for residential rentals in the city of Toronto as, as is practically possible. Um, the only uh, significant blip of vacancies that I ever see is when a pre-construction or in a, in a condo building is going up and, and the buyers have the right to there's a period of time, I don't want to get into the, 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 the explanation right now, but it's called interim occupancy where you don't own the unit yet, but you have the right to occupy it or lease it. And usually that interim occupancy is anywhere from 4 to 12 or even 18 months. So you, you, you're allowed to live in it or rent it out, uh, but you don't own it yet and you haven't paid a mortgage, uh, put a money, uh, the money down for the property yet. Um, during that period of time, there's often a glut of, of properties. Um, sorry, an, an oversupply of properties um, that comes on the market. So you'll see as a broker, you'll see an address 100 Simcoe Street. And in our daily news flashes, you see 20 or 30 or 50 new properties. Um, and because there's a lot of supply in a new building, it will take a few weeks, sometimes a few months for all that to be absorbed. But that's the majority of the real vacancy that I see. And some people have, have said to me in the past, well, but if there's so much demand, 50, even 100 units becoming available overnight for rent in a building, those should get snapped up within the first week. Yes, the, the no part of the answer is, um, has anybody been in a building that's in interim occupancy? Sort of, some of you? It's not pretty sometimes. Yeah. Like literally, uh, the, the, the walls in the hallways are not, are not painted. Uh, there's no carpet on the floor, it's concrete. Um, the elevators are covered in, in cardboard protective wrap on the inside with just a cutout where you push the buttons. You're, you're living in a semi-construction zone. So I just wanna offer that why it takes sometimes a few months for even 20 or 30 units to be absorbed by the market. Can you get a, a better deal? You can't, you, you, as, a, as a tenant, you yeah. can, yeah. because uh, along with interim occupancy comes something called uh, what we call phantom rent. So you're paying the developer usually the equivalent of an average uh, property tax and mortgage payment per month. So if your mortgage payment and property taxes were going to be $3,000 a month once you close on the transaction, you're paying around that, $2,800, $3,100. Uh, there's a formula on how to calculate the phantom rent, but you are paying that. So if you're an investor and you're not intending to move into that unit and all of a sudden you're paying $3,000 a month, then yes, there can be an incentive to say, oh, we'll take 25. sure, you know, if, if, if it becomes uh, something that's bothering you enough. So these are some areas, uh, uh, funny we're talking about uh, uh, infrastructure. These are some areas, I'm not a huge fan of focusing on specific areas, but I know a lot of people are, so I'm just putting it out there. Here are some of the Metrolinx expansion locations um, that, uh, that you might want to keep an eye on. Uh, these are, are well-known ones. I believe these are a little bit lesser known, and I will show them here in a second. Um, what I want to talk to you about, you know, I'll just show you them here now. Um, and again, I'm happy to send this to anybody who wants. Purple is a new station and the pink is a proposed station. Um, so if you are thinking long-term, 5, 10, 20 years, think about picking up some properties. The, the thing that's interesting, and one of the reasons that I'm not a huge fan of location-based searching is, again, when I started full-time about 20 years ago, it was still possible to get that insider's tip or to have a, a counselor tell a developer who would tell you somehow at a cocktail party, you know, they're gonna be spending $2 billion in that area. That was still sort of possible. But then this crazy thing happened, the internet. And, uh, and everything is out there. 
just about the moment uh, it's it's talked about. People are, are are fascinated, especially with real estate. Bloggers will go to uh, council meetings just to listen about you know what's going to be happening. I went and spent two hours about two weeks ago at uh, an Ontario uh, a building code meeting because a homeowner in Toronto was basically taking the city of Toronto to court, Ontario building code court, saying because they'd been rejected multiple times to build a laneway house. And they had, their argument was, and they had lawyers and architects, like they had a whole team there. Their argument was that they had satisfied the Ontario building code. And the city of Toronto was just saying, nope, 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 doesn't work, doesn't work. Um, so anyway, uh, people like me or others are passionate about certain things and will go to the most obscure meetings and will then write about it online or talk about it with you fine people. So I don't find that there are these hidden gems really uh, uh, available anymore. I feel like the information is disseminated quite quickly. And so, sorry, I, I feel like it is, yes. And I feel like people then, as soon as it becomes semi-public knowledge, that upside or, or potential is priced in very quickly. Not all of it, but enough that it doesn't become a steal anymore. You're not getting a hint ahead. Yeah, you're not getting an, it. Exactly, exactly that. Once people know about it, it's it's been a, the market's already absorbed that. Um, so I'll just come back to. But again, I know people like to know about these things, so I'm putting it out there. So one thing: has anybody ever heard of dynamic zoning? So, sorry, yeah. So dynamic zoning is very interesting, and uh, in, I think it was Innisfil just put out a big proposal, um, and that's something I I'm just putting on your radars for the next decade or so. Dynamic zoning basically says that, <laughs> and I. I'm still learning about it myself, so I'll, I'll, I'll so try. A house or something in a, in a lawn or something? No, not quite. Well, maybe down the road, but basically the idea is that um, uh, an a areas are zoned a certain way now, so single family homes, but when certain thresholds are met in that area, the zoning updates and increases automatically. So it's dynamic in that as a neighborhood changes and retail is eliminated to build condos or, or uh, 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 office condos um, to, to give ser uh, area for service providers to, to work. Um, the zoning overall in the area upgrades by itself. Upgrades to what? Upgrades to, the ne to more density oh. or to a higher, uh, higher value zoning. Right. Um, so this is something and it's, it's out there. Again, I'm not making it up. The most in interesting thing the that I... Zoning is done by who? By the... Municipality. People well, by the usually the zoning department who takes zoning. direction from, from uh, councillors. Have you ever had a situation where somebody sold a property on the basis of the fact that, that the zoning has permitted for higher density? So the idea they, they look to sell to some builder or developer with the, with the incentive that they would possibly look to tear down the house or, or increase its, you know, like for example, in some homes, I know what it is, is you have a single, um, it would be like, Detached residential, but in other cases, if it's, it's zoned RM, it means multiple residential. Right. Which means if you want to do something like a laneway, yeah. you can get two residencies on the same property. Right. So my question to you is, have people, have you sold or, or any of your colleagues have you sold on the basis of just the, the zoning yeah. change? So I would argue that that is literally one of the definitions of, of a real estate broker's job, that they should understand what's avail what can be done with that property. So the answer is yes, we have done that. Um, I've, I've seen other seller, sellers actually sometimes are more, they have a vested interest, a big vested interest um, who do enough research, who figure out that they, they have something special. And then I see on the other side, buyers who are more astute or they just do it every day or they're working with certain service prof professionals who do the research and figure out without the seller knowing, the buyer figures out that there is greater potential and they're able to, they'll pay more than just about anybody else because nobody else knows about it. And, and they do, and they know that there's more potential there. Yeah. So that's dynamic zoning. Um, and again, I think if you're interested in learning about it, I really suggest you guys do learn about it because I think it is going to be one of the ways that municipalities are going to evolve more organically rather than in fits and start uh, and stops. Um, for those of you who don't know, Diviana, I apologize because I know I ex explain this in my course, but the massive boom of condos that we're experiencing in Toronto can literally be traced back to, I think it's the uh, the new official plan of the city of Toronto for 2005. Is that right, Lawrence? Um, that official plan 
uh, the municipality said, we want more density on our major arteries. Stop with the urban sprawl. It's too expensive. We cannot afford to dig up every street and increase the services, increase the sewers, increase the water capacity, uh, fiber, et cetera, and, and even just roadways. So what the new official plan said was overnight, you could own a, a store on Young Street with an apartment above, and overnight, you were allowed, instead of going up three to three stories, overnight, theoretically, if you amassed enough properties around you, you could go up to 40 or 50 or 60 stories. Um, and, and so that's literally the genesis of, of how we I got mean, to where we are today. In, in downtown, you, have height, you can do as much, but outside downtown, you can build such towers, right? There's still, there's still restrictions of, of sorts. So for example, uh, one area that I know uh, Mayor Tory would like, he says he'd like to see uh, developed uh, more density, and it's true if you look at it, there's nothing there, is Danforth. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, it's a fantastic uh, uh, subway line. Um, but there's mostly uh, low rise. There's there's very very little. You're starting to see some four or five story buildings. Um, uh, so there are uh, zoning so there are restrictions in certain areas. Of course, you can, absolutely. You know, build and like in downtown, they give you like 50, 60 in downtown. They don't give it. Usually, you still have to fight very very hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, and it, and there's a, and Lawrence knows very well. There's a there there are two elements usually at play. One is density, and one is height. Um, and you have to find a formula that works for both. Yeah, they're doing it on Bloor West, Bloor, Bloor Corridor in one principle. There's a, you're right, I believe it was 2005 that came up. It's a mid-rise mid -rise development study. It's based on, uh, they call it basically, it's like a pyramidal thing. Like you can build up the age, you have you stepping back mm -hmm. from the street line. It's because of shadow studies and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But they're encouraging that kind of thing. So. Yeah, that's the, those those studies that make it 12 years now to deliver keys to a condo buyer. <laughs> Yes. Shops, dog mills, one of such examples. Yeah. Oh, uh, as far as density? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah, the that plaza was. I don't without, know. Uh, uh, any yeah, height. height and now I I suspect I suspect that that whole parcel um, either had or was approved for a certain type of zoning. I don't I don't know though why specifically there. I know because we own we own a unit in one of those buildings, um, and it's. What's interesting is it's not even on Don Mills or Lawrence. The the buildings are actually set back a little bit, um, and they're on a on a on a side street, literally. Uh, so I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> My counselor was telling me that things are going to change. You know, it's not like before. So a lot of things are going to change, and uh, you know, construction. There's going to be a lot of construction. Where whereabouts is our deal? I live on the Danforth. On the Danforth. Danforth is the only area where I, I would really so believe beaches, that that might be true. On the beaches, there are yeah. a few There are, but it's still so slow. Huh? It's not. It's still so slow. Yeah. It's not going to address the demand no, no, in no, time. No, no, no. It's not going to yeah. demand. But it, things will continue to move forward. Yeah, you definitely. Look what's happening on the Avenue Road and on Young Street, <coughs> especially in the uh, all the condos are going up now on the Edmonton Davisville area. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that is a prime area. Yeah, those are prime areas. Agree. It is. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not uh, a broker who pitches pre-construction constantly. Um, it is right for the right person in the right situation. So I want you to be aware of it. I don't want you to be scared of it. Um, but you should be. You should know that it's not for everybody. So one of the things, for example, uh, and I'm going to use a very rough number: downtown Toronto condos that are resale. The average you can you can buy a unit a good unit in a good area for between nine hundred and a thousand dollars a square foot, maybe up to a thousand fifty right now. That's a resale condo in downtown Toronto. To buy pre construction, you're looking at you, now for a good project, good area, good builder developer team, etc. Usually you're looking at minimum thirteen hundred, more like fourteen hundred, and it's not unusual to see it go up more than that. Uh, there was one I'm cherry picking, but there was one development. Uh, I think it's called King Toronto. Um, the starting price, this was a year ago almost, the starting price for pre-construction units in that development was $1,600 a square foot. The average was over $2,000 a square foot. Now, they had this whole famous architects and like really building up a lot of hype. Um, but the reality is, and this is why I talk about speculation, um, to invest in pre-construction condos saying, ah, they'll go up, I'll assign my contract, make $100,000 per per unit that I, that I bought, no problem. Yeah, it's great if it works out. 
Um, but when it doesn't work out, it's, it's not so great because if you can't qualify, so I, I've seen people go on a tear. I'll buy five condo units, yeah, but in three or four or five years, you actually have to be able to close on them um, or sell them. But if you can't sell them and you never ever had the opportunity, you never had the means to, to close on them, why did you buy them in the first place? So it's, it's, a, it's a gamble. If you're buying, if you're using it as an investment strategy, and you don't have the means to follow through on your commitment. Yeah, but look, quite a few people are doing that. Right? <coughs> I know that. Saying? I'm aware. Yeah. But so, so what what happens when you can't close? So, the, what I find that's interesting about humans is we like to talk about. Thank you, Olga, for following me with the camera. That's very good. I didn't realize you're doing that. Um, what's interesting about humans is they like to talk about uh, when they do something that's good. Yeah. You know, they make money. They like to brag. A lot of people don't say, Cam, I just wanted to share with you that deal I did last two years ago. I just lost $150,000. Isn't that great? Um, a lot of people don't talk about that. So I, realistically, I have clients, and I'm, I'm not making fun. I have clients who come to me and say, Claude, I have a problem. So I, I, I like to think that I hear about some of the real estate mistakes more often than most. Um, and I'm not saying, I, I think that in the last 12 years, there are still more winners than losers, but I have had, you were asking what happens. I mean, technically you've made a contractual commitment right. to buy a property at a certain price. And uh, the thing that's interesting about developer or builders contracts, they are entirely in the favor of the developer and builder, much more so than a typical agreement of purchase and sale between a, a, a individual buyer, individual seller of a resale property. Those forms are usually about balanced between the two, if you're using industry standard forms, I find. But developer and builder forms, completely skewed in the favor of the builder and the developer. If you don't pay the money that you're supposed to pay when you're supposed to pay it, you lose, at the very least, you lose your deposit, um, which is not insignificant. If you're buying a, a $600,000 uh, pre-construction condo, which is ex extraordinarily difficult to find these days in downtown Toronto, that pre-construction purchase price, um, you're going to have put at least 10%, sometimes 20 or 25% as a down pay, as a deposit or as a series of deposits. So if you can't follow through on your commitment, uh, it's a lot of money on the table that you may be losing. So that's all the negative. There is positive. Again, I'm a supporter of pre-construction condo purchases when it's either that or you're not going to get into the market. That's more or less where I, where I draw the line. Um, or if you're an investor and you actually have the means to close on the purchase uh, in three years, five years, six years, um, if you have not been able to assign your contract. That's pretty simple to me. Um, and some of the pros, why some people will consider it, um, uh, are listed here. Um, so I've talked about them a little bit more in detail. It's easy-ish to do. Um, small upfront cash requirement. Oftentimes, the deposit structure is over a 12 or 18 month period of time. So you're giving $5,000 or $10,000 when you sign the contract, and then uh, the balance up to 5% deposit within 30 days, three months later, another 5%, six months later, another 5%, that type of thing. Sometimes it's 2.5% uh, slices. Um, so some people who don't have a huge chunk of money to put down on a, on a property right away, it kind of allows you to get into it slowly. Um, Is there a mechanism, mechanism in place that allows you to sell before you pay the final amount? So you yes. It. Yeah, it's an assign. It's assigning the, the contract. Yeah, but you have to know that there's the right to do that with the developer. What the bank can do to avoid capital gain? <coughs> How quickly can you do to avoid the capital gain? So that's what I was saying earlier. Is and I'm not an accountant, but I know that CRA has been going after some people who do assignment sales before they close on the transaction, saying that they should be paying capital gains and HST. Um, so uh, I'm just saying, if you're going to do it. Be aware. Do banks uh, finance that too, pre-construction? Like... Uh, as far as, I, I mean, you can finance anything. I have not heard of a logical financing tool to finance the deposit yeah. portion. But as far as the, the purchase itself, yes. When you, in fact, most developers require that you bring uh, a mortgage approval letter, which is, this is a little bit odd. You're supposed to bring a letter that says from a bank saying, Claude can qualify to buy this $600,000 condo today. And this letter is good for 90 days. That condo will be ready in five years. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand it, but 
But that's well, how the industry if, works. If you borrow for the deposit, you're increasing the odds that you're leveraging and you could really get more. Money. True. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then for those who do enjoy pre-construction condo investing, uh, if that's even a term, um, as you said earlier, it, people for years were buying one, two, five, 10, 20 properties. I have a client who owns 15 properties in Toronto. He bought them all, you know, eight, 10 years ago. He's done phenomenally well. He actually hasn't assigned any of them. He closed on all of them, but see, he had the ability to do that. Um, and, and they've all doubled, tripled in value from yeah, what he paid. You about eight, 10 years back, people are standing in line for days yeah. just to you know, qualify. You remember? Yeah. Like in the winter, we were like fighting with each other. I'm, I'm always a little concerned when you can look at a situation and, and put a finger on it and say, that's herd mentality. Herd mentality makes me very uncomfortable. No, but a lot of people made money. They would like overnight. I, they were I understand that. Line to get, you know. I understand. But there are also people. I have I, I have files. I can well. I can't show you, but I have files of people who did that, overpaid in my opinion, and then the developer came after them because they 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 couldn't uh, close on multiple properties at the same time. Right. So we're, we're talking about losing one person I know on one property lost a quarter million dollars on one property, and he had three. So uh, all I'm saying is yes, people like to talk about how much money they made when it was good. Uh, the the problem is there was no even then there was no rhyme or reason there was no proper logic to be able to say this one is going to be the one that's going to be stable and it's going to work out well and it's going to appreciate well people were guessing location's good it should be okay yeah. developer is a good quality developer it should be okay too but there was no certainty no oh. Um, and again, it's it's okay for some. If 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 you understand the risks, I have no problem with it. But I, a lot of people standing in line, they weren't even thinking risks. They were just thinking gold yeah, and really dollar really, signs. They don't want to miss the opportunity, right? Because it was greed. Yeah. Yeah. Greed. Sure. I agree with you. I agree. You know, because they know the price is going to go up. No, they what. thought. Yeah, they thought. They didn't know. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, and that's the part that just makes me a little bit uncomfortable about that mentality of investing that way. Um, and again, theoretically, with pre-construction, um, you're paying a little bit ahead of where the market is now. But if the market does what it's supposed to do for the next four, five, six years, you should be ahead of the game. You should own a property that is worth eight hundred thousand that you only paid six hundred thousand for. <coughs> um, so, just a few tips if you are going to go down that road: um, make sure the location is is supported by strong fundamentals, uh, efficiency in transit growth of population or expected growth of population, um, good employment market, proximity to schools, post-secondary and others. Um, and again, realtors are incentivized to push pre-construction because they make almost double the money. So just ask questions about that. Uh, investing in the US, I don't do it currently. Um, you're welcome to if you'd like. Uh, what I would tell you is that I know some people who, individuals who've invested a little bit, done well, I know the exact same number of in individuals who've done horribly doing this in the last 10, 12 years. And the ones who I find reliably follow through on their intention or their interest in investing in the US and, um, uh, and who don't lose money are the ones who have economy of scale. Um, it's really difficult to, to manage something at a, at a distance. You know, say I'm, you're buying one house or two houses or a duplex or a triplex. Uh, you really have to build an entire team um, remotely, or you have to visit, uh, travel there regularly. And if things go badly, it's it's very different from being able in Toronto to get in your car, drive up to an hour, Barry, um, an hour, an hour and a bit, to to manage it, or to find to fire a property manager, or fire a realtor who's not doing a good job, or follow the real estate lawyer uh, a little bit more closely in a certain process of buying or selling um, than it is at a distance. But if you're good at managing things at a distance, it could be for you. Just wanted to put a little bit of information uh, up here for you. Um, and then there's questions about the uh, exchange rate. Um, yes, buying uh, uh, can be difficult, uh, but once you've made the purchase, some clients of mine say that they really enjoy receiving rent in US dollars. So there's a, over enough time, it'll be somewhat offset. I think there's also the issues too, if you like, I don't know if the, uh, if the banking, uh, the financial institutions in the States will give you the same kind of um, credit. Credit that they do with the Canadian bankers. To the Canadian. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's my understanding, yeah. Well, the well, bank is now giving, asking you to, if you want to buy real estate in the United States, they have a, they're giving you a mortgage. Yes, I, re I read about that. Yeah. 
No, but the Gosh. second thing, the prices in the United States are much cheaper than in Canada. Like you're looking for a house there. Depends. Can, Depends where. Yeah, where. But mostly it's around about three, four hundred thousand. Yeah, in many, in many areas. Like I have to find a property in Miami when you get the same special. thing for three hundred thousand. Yeah. Better. Yeah, I agree. But at the same time, even more so if you're buying there and if you're buying there because you can't afford to buy here or invest here, all the more uh, urgency or importance to, to keep an eye on your investment. Yeah. And my, well, all I'm saying is people don't necessarily understand ahead of time how difficult it can be at a distance. Um, so anybody who's into uh, short-term rentals, sorry. I'd prefer, if you really, really wanted to invest in the States, I would say research a few cities, contact, and, and you're going to have to do so much homework, but try to find a good real estate advisor of some sort. It'll probably end up being a broker, a realtor, but some sort of real estate advisor, or find somebody who seems to be doing well investing locally in that city, Meet, reach out to them. They probably run their own meetup, seriously. Reach out to them and ask them if they have a good team of professionals that help them. And then just start asking questions. Um, I, as far as states go, I mean, people still still enjoy Florida, still enjoy Arizona to a certain extent. Um, Texas has been on a tear that it looks like is not going to stop anytime soon. Um, uh, but no state tax in Texas. yes, that's right. Um, but I'm, it's not something that I'm that I'm, and and I have an advantage. My one of my brothers is a is a top attorney in California. He's invested in in Texas, and to me, I just First of all, I, I don't have unlimited resources, so I want to have things that I can go and touch, properties I can get to, um, and where I can add the most value, I think, is locally. But, but that's just for me. Um, anybody who's working with, uh, with Airbnb, just some tips on, on how to keep on top of things. Um, there's some apps down here for, for apps. AirDNA is a really interesting one if you're looking to do research uh, on Airbnb. So if you're trying to understand if an area will support, support a certain price point uh, on a per night stay, and it'll give you uh, uh, numbers as far as average, um, average occupancy um, uh, on a city and, and town level. Um, Airbnb, again, I'm saying Airbnb, there are a lot of different uh, short-term rental sites and services. Airbnb itself has a, a dynamic pricing uh, function that they just launched uh, not too long ago that can work for a certain type of property in a certain area. Um, and there are certain things that might seem simple, but even just uh, setting up an automatic reply. I mean, in this day and age, we want instant gratification. So somebody who clicks on your thing and says, you know, hey, uh, do you allow dogs? If you take six hours to get to, back to them, believe it or not, a lot of the time they're already going to have booked something else. Um, so there's some automation that you can set up to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, one of the big problems is having uh, a housekeeping or cleaning service that you've arranged but they get sick, they get confused because they have other places that they have to clean as well. Um, so one function that some top Airbnb hosts say is very good is to actually treat the, the cleaners the way you do your guests. So send them the same type of notifications saying, okay, you know, uh, guest just checked out. Any time in the next four hours is great because that's when we have another guest checking in and just staying on top of them. Um, and, and wireless entry codes is a really great way to do that. Um, there's a great... I mean, I've already talked about it, but I'll, if, you ever, if you're interested in learning about automation, there's a really simple plug and play protocol called If This Then That, I-F-T-T-T. -T -T. Um, so you can really set up some great, uh, whether it has to do with cameras or Wi-Fi connected uh, keyless entry um, uh, systems to basically send notifications to your email address if somebody check, uh, uh, presses the button saying check out. And then your email address, if you set it up the right way, so if that happens, then it'll send an email to your cleaners saying, so-and-so just checked out, the next person checking in based on this cloud calendar is at 3 p.m. today. So anyway, I know it sounds super confusing. Uh, that's the protocol and the website, so IFTTT. It's, it's absolutely, it's, you can do the simplest things that you can automate. So for example, if you get an email to Gmail, with a photo attachment. You can have a protocol that says, grab that photo and put it into my iCloud uh, uh, storage. Um, just 
endless, endless. Uh, and the great thing is a lot of people will have already built the protocol. So even though you, you have all these different platforms, Dropbox, Google, Gmail, et cetera, um, some people will have said, oh, I've already, I've already built the chain of commands to get from A to, to, to B. So anyway, if you're interested, you can look it up. Um, <coughs> Something that a lot of people don't, don't talk about, there's an interesting startup in the US, which is already huge. They figured out that um, uh, office buildings in the States and in North America, a lot of the time, the energy consumption, 40% of it was just from plug load. Plug load being it's the machine or whatever it is is not turned on, but it's plugged in. So the power is constantly there available. Um, and you can imagine an office building, 40% of the hydro bill would add up to a lot of, uh, of money. So um, that's how I became more aware of this. And you'll probably, if you start Googling it, you'll start seeing that for residential uses or, or small commercial operations like, like this office, there's some great gadgets, Wi-Fi connected plugs that will say, you know, if we don't detect a movement for 30, 30 minutes, we cut the power to this, to whatever's plugged into this plug. So they're basically devices that get plugged into the uh, uh, power receptacle. They have Wi-Fi built into them, and then you plug into them. So a lot of, again, IFTTT can be uh, really well used for that uh, as well. And then lastly, um, so I, my pitch earlier was people who, have, who buy properties for under market value and, and assign them or resell them. Um, so just super, super quickly, maybe more for the novice people, some of the quick ways to increase value um, are, is really flipping, right? So adding cosmetic improvements. If you have a property that you bought and you think you got a good deal on it or you're sure you got a good deal on it, so you know what, I don't need to live here. I don't need to hold it as a long-term rental. I just want to add as much value as I can quickly. Depending on the market and the product type, you may be better off, believe it or not, than instead of doing a substantial renovation like ripping out the kitchen and redesigning it or doing all the washrooms or all the flooring, you might be better just doing a relatively simple kind of what in the industry we can talk about as a lipstick job. Um, that could be a, a quick way to add value. Uh, more, more time, two to six months of, of work usually, would be to do more substantial renovations. Um, wholesaling properties is, uh, is a term where if you, for whatever reason, get wind of a property that you're able to buy for 25% below market value, and believe it or not, it happens, um, you can assign, you can use that agreement of purchase and sale that you have, you can assign that good deal to somebody for 5% under market value or 10% under market value. Um, and you're making the difference there as an assignment fee. That's called wholesaling properties. So how do you, uh, you know, find these wholesaling properties? Because that seems to be, uh, you know, it's not too complicated, right? All you have to do yeah, just go knock on 10,000 doors and somebody will say yes, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> no, but in Toronto, how are you going to get it? Because, you know, why would somebody sell it for, you know, 40, 50 percent less? Uh, not, not necessarily 40, but I've seen anywhere from 10 to 30 percent even 35. Um, why? There are a lot of reasons. And wholesaling is huge in the US. You can Google yeah, it very well. Um, uh, my brother's the largest wholesaler in Canada, so I know that it works. Um, yeah, he wholesales at least 100 properties a year. What's in the Sorry? He has a meetup. Yeah, go to his meetup. Yeah. Oh. Same last name as me. First name is Luke, L-U-C. Um, but it, people are motivated for different reasons. Um, I mean, he's had, he's had people who, who've called him and said, I didn't realize the banks would only give me three months of missing payments before they would, you know, move on me. And they said, the, somebody just knocked on the door, delivered a registered letter, uh, a certified letter, and said that I have five days to pay everything that I owe or a bailiff is coming and locking the doors and changing the locks. Five days. You can't, I'm, I'm a good broker. I can't list on the MLS and get a closing in five days. I can't. But a wholesaler or somebody who's in the business of, of buying cash and flipping properties, that they could. And so, you know, it, are you going to leave $50,000? Right? Or he has the money, so you can well, say, okay, I'll Well, yeah, Whole, wholesalers um, typically will sell their contract. Yeah. So they buy certain properties to flip themselves, yeah. but some of them, they don't close on them, and they just assign yeah. that contract for a profit. Um, it's 9 o'clock on the dot. That's awesome. Uh, so uh, any questions before we break? I get chocolate. Yes. Um, you had said earlier in your presentation that condo could be the um, fast depreciating asset mm -hmm. in the last you know, couple of years. What about land in general? Like, 
I would say, sorry, and I, I did say that you're right. I'd like to revise that. Anything really under a million dollars in the in the tight GTA, spe specifically in Toronto, I think is going to appreciate faster. But wouldn't over the long, do you think over the long term that land would probably appreciate more in the long run just because they're not making it anymore as opposed to condos, which are just... If, if I have my druthers, I will always prefer that somebody buys a freehold property. Yeah. But I can't buy... 50 houses but over enough time i might be able to buy 50 condos like there's a difference in price a lot of the time so to have a two-bedroom condo or two-bedroom house in downtown toronto there's a difference of at least half a million dollars between those two price points so would you advise that the goal of the investor well i guess it depends on everyone's personal strategy exactly would it be a good approach to work on acquiring land so maybe a condo would be like a stepping stone to acquiring a freehold property then yeah, usually what I see in, uh, oh no, the gentleman left, but that presentation that he that he was uh, at a couple of years ago, that's exactly what I was talking about, is people who've bought a, co a condo, bought another condo, bought two more condos, um, eventually, just with the increase in value and pulling out equity, or selling them to then buy freehold properties. Um, a lot of the time people will go build a portfolio of freehold properties and say, you know what, this is too much of a hassle, I just want commercial properties. I just want industrial buildings or multi-residential properties. I don't want a mishmash of houses. So yes, usually there's that kind of property ladder, though there's nothing wrong. I, I hope you guys will like... Commercial property. Why? Well, a lot of reasons, but one of the big ones is the tenant pays for everything. The tenant pays the property taxes, the tenant pays for repairs, maintenance, property management. The tenant pays the landlord to manage their tenancy. Um, but... It's more expensive generally than residential. So just not on a per square foot basis, but just general scope. And, uh, and the financing options are very different. You're going to be putting down minimum 30, usually 35, 40% down payment to buy a truly commercial property. So you need a lot deeper pockets. What exactly then do you do as a commercial real estate investor? You just buy the property and then lease it out and the tenant takes care of everything? If your lease is worded the right way, yes, that's how it works. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have a, a longer chat another time. Uh, George, can you share some light on what's happening with cottages and all these properties outside uh, Peterborough and mm -hmm. these areas? And you mentioned that seniors are living more in downtown area rather than the So, okay. how does that. Are you talking about cottages, like true cottages, or kind of uh, areas that are four seasons and people just live there all the time anyways. Four seasons, but I have also heard like people like in on the young line near Rosedale area, so many people have cottages and then they kind of move around and then like when they're retired, so they want to move live in downtown at the same time in the summer they want to move out. Yeah, no, I, I have clients who, who do that, who they spend the summer basically at the cottage. Um, and then the winter, either, I have some client, the, the, the newest thing I would say is people who will spend four or five months out of the year in Ontario, at a, usually by the water somewhere at a cottage, but the rest of the time will be down south. So not even having another property in, in Ontario. Um, but I do have clients who do exactly what you just said. Um, I, haven't, I haven't really seen a huge, I haven't seen anything very interesting to talk about based on that trend. Like I don't see the property values going up or down significantly enough to say oh, this trend is affecting things in an interesting way this trend, you're talking about cottages? yeah just cottages in general yes uh, do you have clients who uh, rent out their paid off houses uh, particularly in north york and are retirees that then instead of you know spend a lot of time on cruises instead have, is that yes what i would say uh and, and again this is not a it's a personal mm -hmm. preference but um Having a, 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 an asset in the city of Toronto, a real estate asset that's in good condition, that's paid off, right now, it doesn't, emotionally it's satisfying or it's reassuring, maybe is the right word to use to some people, but logically it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense when you, it's, the math is relatively simple. You can borrow against that asset at 2.7% interest and you can invest that money even incredibly conservatively and make 5%. And the difference between 2.7 and 5% is just free money. You haven't worked for it. Um, 
And then if you want to get into more interesting returns, you can get into sevens and eights and 10%. I have clients who literally are in the exact same situation you just described, have taken out just a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of equity out of their principal residence at these incredibly low rates, and have gone in in a very methodical, careful way, uh, buddied up with uh, mortgage agents who do private lending. So very conservative first or small second mortgages, but they're getting nine, 10, 11, 12 percent interest on them. So um, uh, your your initial question was, I, I switched it on you. Your initial question was going away. Look, the rules just changed around short-term rentals uh, in the city of Toronto. A lot of people believe that there's not enough manpower to enforce the the new rules. Um, I would tend to agree. I don't think it's going to be enforceable for at least a few years. Um, you could be one of the unlucky ones who who gets caught, but at the end of the day, I mean, I don't I don't think that in that situation it'd be a horrible idea to rent out your home for or a portion of your home for a month at a time and to have that pay for you to be able to do something else. I don't see, I don't see any problem with that. The other yeah. thing that I've seen, in, in having lived in this area for what, 30 years, is that now you see for lease, for lease, for lease. People yeah. are not selling their property. Yeah, less so. Okay. And you never saw for lease sign. Yeah, especially in areas that are very, very mature and stable, such yeah. as you know, Midtown Toronto, Rosedale, Downtown Toronto. They, they may be getting a job somewhere else. Yeah. They, they're holding on to their assets yeah. in Toronto. Yeah, and very much to your point about not making any more land. It's it's directly correlated. That that yeah. mentality is if I sell this property now and I want to re-enter the Midtown Toronto market in five or ten years, okay. I may not be able to. But are you talking about commercial property? That's, no, no, that's... I'm talking about houses. You want, yeah. They have a per, what would normally be a for sale sign outside that says for lease. Yeah. And there, I mean, I go up and down Broadway all the time. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them. I agree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We meet every last Thursday of the month um, from 7 to 9. You're welcome to come a little bit earlier, but definitely we start at 7.